backstory they didn't have the time or the budget to tell. A ton of backstory. How did we get to the beginning of that movie? And so the idea was, and we presented to them and they came up with the story, the idea was let's do the prequel to that reboot in comic book form. And so the only, that prequel only exists today and will only, based on what they've told us, will only exist forever in graphic novel form. It's, called, it's actually called Star Trek Countdown. And um, it basically literally ends a moment before the beginning of the new movie. And to me, that's a good, that's a good example of transmedia, which where it's basically you have one format telling a piece of the story that continues in the next format. Yeah, just generally economically, is, is the money, can you make money doing uh, cartooning, or is it in uh, video games? Is it Hollywood? I mean, you know, so if somebody's looking at entering into this field, uh, how does it pan out? I'll answer quickly and say that a lot of comic book artists discover video games and they never come back. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I, I, I will tell you. I mean, there's you know, you know in the scale of economics, um, uh, you know, Skylanders video game or a, uh, a Grand Theft Auto. Um, or Halo. I mean, these are these are tens of millions of dollars to develop, and hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue. The entire graphic novel and comic book industry is shy of a billion dollars. So, we are often perceived as the cool kids. A lot of IP is generated out of comic books. You know, the Avengers movie is not the top movie worldwide. It's one of the top three. Um, you know, the, the Batman trilogy, another giant success, came. You know, there are, there are dozens and dozens of examples I can name. But from a revenue standpoint, I never tell anyone go into the comic book business to make money. <laughs> it may happen, and it'd be a good thing. And believe me, there are plenty of examples of, of people who are doing just great. But um, I, that wouldn't be what I would say. Uh, there are other professions where it's a little bit more of uh, uh, like a shore of success. Well, don't those artists get royalties though if their property gets picked up by a movie studio? Uh, Yes and no. Uh, it depends how good a lawyer they had. Um, and, and often, I, I mean, often Hollywood accounting, being Hollywood accounting, you know, there's a purchase price of the property and there's a royalty based on net profits. And according to what I read in the Hollywood Reporter, there's never a net profit on any of it. So, you know, I, I mean, it's, again, it, it's, you know, for, for everybody sitting here that got, got a really good deal, the guy next to him did not get the same good deal. Yeah, and like the Kirby lawsuit. Uh, going to the, I think it's Court. still in Supreme Court. Right, right. The Kirby family, but, you know, arguing for compensation for X Men and Captain America and things like that. Uh, whether they'll get anything or not, who knows? But uh, it's, it's even at that level, even the top creators of, uh, in the comic book industry uh, and their family members still have to fight <laughs> for revenue. I mean, look what happened to Superman right, and its creators. So, and like I had started with, uh, with Alfred E. Newman. I mean, you got to fight. If you create something, you got to fight for it, and you got to protect it. Uh, and we've talked about different ways to do that. Uh, but the main thing is to not give up on your product and to uh, not lose control of your product, whatever it might be. But the creator worth researching, if you're interested in this, would be Todd McFarlane. Todd was a well-known Marvel comics artist. He, did, he, he rebooted Spider-Man, essentially, in the late 80s, early 90s. And Todd went off with a bunch of other Marvel creators who formed Image Comics and created a character called Spawn. And Todd fully controlled all the rights to Spawn and then decided that he didn't like the toy offers that he was getting in terms of both financial and quality. So he decided to create a toy company to make Spawn toys. And uh, I mean, again, put his money where his mouth was, um, or is, and made probably the highest quality boys action figures that had ever been made at the point. Yeah. Um, and ended up with the other, the big companies, Hasbro and Mattel, following him in terms of, you know, oh, this is how you make an action figure, and this is how you do these sorts of things. And so McFarlane, he created the company to create Spawn toys, and then went out and got other licenses to compete with the, with the big guys, but controlled the Spawn movie, and controlled the Spawn animated series. You know, it was, it was all him. And made the decision, for better or for worse, in the case of the Spawn movie. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's a tale for another day. But, but for all the people who are creating IP, whatever field, and you think that Hollywood's going to be, you know, how you're going to strike it rich, uh, chances are not it's going to be an exercise in extreme frustration because the amount that they're going to pay you is in the option, it's probably $1,500. Nothing. Uh, and then in terms of the exercise price, 
even the full exercise price for properties that are known properties, it's not going to change your life. I mean, it's the, at very most, $100,000 you know, and everything. And so you lost control of your property. So I have lots and lots of clients with comic strips and books and all of that. And they think Hollywood, when they come home, is going to be their salvation. And it is very much not. Um, usually the option just expires for like five years of your life. Uh, in the rare instance where it happens, it's, a, it's probably a zero less than you think it's going to be. Yeah. Because you don't, I mean, unless you've got you know, a big, big, big name, then, then they come crawling and you can start a price. If you start, if you can actually get a bidding more, then you can make real money. But for most people, small independent creators who get an option deal out of Hollywood, it's not even worth the time. There's a, um, there is occasionally the sort of same story, but the the brighter side of that, you have creators like Ashley Wood, who we worked with at IDW for 15 years, and once you sell one of his properties, then the other studios go, who's this guy, Ashley Wood, and we can sell another one, and we can sell, and we can sell another one. But again, he'd be the one in a thousand um, creators. And you know, we're very happy to take the check if the project's not made, and three years later, when the option is part, we'll take a look. <laughs> so a couple more questions. questions. Um, if you're working with a syndicate or a particular weekly journal and they're your sole client, uh, do they do the copyright registration and policing for you or is that still your responsibility? Uh, well, the, the newspaper that published my cartoons had a copyright and the, the paper um, had an overall copyright for the, the paper. But I actually had a contract with them that I, I held my intellectual property. Okay. So, yeah, and that actually came up because they wanted to republish this as well as one day. But you mentioned that with West you wanted to uh, copyright before you gave it to them, but I assume they were the sole publishers of those strips. Well, well um, in the instant book, if you create your own IP, then it's a question of whatever license agreement you negotiate. Uh, for me, Wes was paying me a fine rate, but you know it wasn't worth my time as a lawyer to create cartoons if I didn't hold the IP. So the result was they got the price they wanted, and I retained the IP rights. Uh, I think that most people who work uh, for him, who aren't the original owners, are all going to be on a work for hire or all rights assignment basis. Uh, and so that's the way most of the world is heading now because those IP lawyers who advise the companies say we want it to say work for hire and then it to say if this doesn't qualify for work for hire because most of this stuff doesn't uh, <laughs> then it's all assignment of rights and so uh, people like him who negotiated with his newspaper to retain rights are the exception these days. Yes. yes. <laughs> and then uh, and for cartoonists, these days, ones that I represent, because I've done ridiculous numbers of comic strip syndication deals, um, what it worked was in the, from the dawn of time up until the 80s, the syndicates owned the copyright. The artists were basically just hired again. Uh, it started to change in the 90s. And basically, every deal I've ever done, the artist owns the copyright, but the contract is so long term with the syndicate, it kind of really doesn't matter as much. I mean, you have to own the copyright, but in terms of how it affects the economics of the relationship, I mean, not for the first 15, 20 years. And so. Okay, okay, okay. Um, just on this point, um, of course, now um, a lot of uh, sound recording artists are at the point where they could terminate their uh, transfers made to record labels, but um, most of them aren't aware of that. In fact, there have been very, very few uh, terminations filed based on the number of sound recording artists who could and, and co composers who could file. I'm wondering how that works in this world of comic book authors. Are they aware that they have the right, basically, to terminate these agreements, even if the agreements say that they're in perpetuity? or if they say that their work made for hire, and in fact, they don't meet the criteria of work made for hire. 
So on a, a typical IDW agreement is shorter term than our competitive agreement. I mean, we're we're a very creator friendly company on our non licensed IP. So we're we're a creator where either IDW owns the, um, the copyright or outright, or where we jointly own it with the creator. Our deals typically are five, seven year deals. There are a few deals that say we own it as long as the book is in print. That's the Watchman case, which you know is, has affected Alan Moore to his detriment. Uh, he claims he likes those checks in though. But anyway, um, he you know basically DC kept Watchman in print forever, and so the, the, they own that title as long as um, uh, as long as they do, and they will of course they will keep it in print forever. And we have a few that are written like that, but I, I, a number of times authors have come to us and said, hey. We noticed, you know, we got a royalty check at eighty-two dollars last year. Um, you clearly aren't selling the book. You're not really promoting it. And we typically, I can only think of maybe one case where we there was a disagreement. We typically will terminate the agreement and say, you know, God, God bless. I mean, we're not it just that's you're, not, you're much nicer than record labels. Well, because <laughs> again, yeah, I mean, I think there, you know, all the the executives of IDW have worked both the creative and the business side of the business. And I think we're. You know, I think we're, you know, at least empathetic to the, the creators and sort of not trying to be exploited to that to that point of view. And frankly, the good, you know, the, the, the quality creators that have come to us have often left their publishers to come to work. You know, I mean, Jeff Campbell and Danger Girl, uh, Jeff, uh, you know, left Wildstorm slash DC to come work with an editor that he had worked with at DC, who ultimately jumped ship to, to come to IDW. But um, uh, you know, so he terminated his agreement at DC under whatever terms that he had to be able to work with us. But but Jeff's now free to do the same. You know, if, if our editor were to leave, or if Jeff would find another, leave, you know, he'd be now free to, to to leave. You know, I I would rather retain you because I'm the better publisher. That's why I want you know I want you to want to you know I want Berkeley Breath. It. We we're going to publish one more book with Berkeley. We've pretty much wiped him. We published everything he's ever drawn. <laughs> so once we get this, this last book, I, I want you to be the creator who says, I want to work with those guys. And that's, so that's our, that's our competitive advantage, I think, against some of our, uh, some, some of the It, it oh. is on the children's books that are going to go on to the digital. Well, there are uh, two, two comments here. Uh, I represent hundreds of artists, uh, who most of whom do own their uh, copyright. What I have found is about 40% of those artists are actually loyal. Uh, to their uh, original publisher, the person who discovered them and gave them their... The other 60% are some version of, there's accumulated, you know, slights, and probably 20% of them, even if it's a great relationship, it's the only relationship they've known, so the grass is always green. So 20% of them will want to leave, 40% of them will want to stay and be loyal, and then there's 40% in between who, or they're happy to stay as long as they can drive a pretty hard deal, and so that's what I see in terms of uh, companies like IDW who are creator friendly. Uh, they normally, I'd say 75% of the time, do retain the artist in the renewal negotiation. But a number of those times, the terms under which the renewal is done uh, are somewhat unsatisfactory for the publisher. But what you were saying about uh, copyright termination, there is no more complicated area of the law than copyright termination. Uh, it is brutally complex legally, on top of which you layer facts that are 40 or 50 years old and maybe a couple of generations dead in between. And so you layer law that's just now coming to matter in turn, and so there are very few cases, as you mentioned, uh, and then decades old contracts, and oh, I remember signing something, and it, it, all sorts of stuff is lost, it's always lost correspondence where, we'll just sign here, and it's not what we really mean, and so, it, and, and so if you're, uh, and, uh, and so copyright termination is an absolute guarantee of a decade worth of litigation if the property is valuable. Uh, to your point of giving the property back, it used to be the case in the book publishing world that there was a very clear end point to book publishing. It's if the book is out of print for more than 12 months, then you may request the copyright be 
restored to you, and if we don't republish within the following six months, I'm generalizing, but more or less, then we have to give it back to you. And I remember thinking in 1999 when I saw my first uh, real book published, I thought, what if it's electronic and they can just, you know, not really have it in publishing, not, not have it published as like books in print, but just sort of there for download. And so every deal I have done for you know, five years before anybody else was thinking about it dealt with it, you know, notwithstanding the above, if royalty check is less than, you know, and I pick some ridiculous number like 50 bucks or 100 bucks, so I've always got it. But now, when they're talking, I mean, book, these uh, print on demand books and ebooks are very typically very low sellers for the long tail. And so it actually matters for a lot of people, as you say, with a $65 check. Yeah, I mean, so there's the legal right to terminate based on copyright law, which is, I mean, if, you, if it's making $100 million, it's worth hiring you know, the three guys in New York and one guy in, in LA who probably sort of understand it to litigate the matter for you. Um, even I, I mean, I, I, I mean, you want to talk, you know, terminate your copyright for a sound recording. I mean, I'll try to find you a lawyer who's done that, but you know, I don't. I, I value my malpractice insurance, and I'll not try it. Both the um, both the Superman lawsuit, the current the current group of them, and the Kirby lawsuit are based on copyright termination. And yeah, I agree. I certainly I'm not a lawyer, and I don't understand uh, the basis. I did I did read the brief that the Kirby estate filed to the Supreme Court, and to the point of remembrances which I thought was a really good point that you bring up on because the problem with copyright is it goes, it goes back a while. The point, you know, when something is old 50 years ago, he, you know, he said, she said is very, is a lot easier. And, you know, there have been a lot of books written about the origins of Marvel Comics, Stanley and Jack Kirby and the other creators. And they each, they each say the same thing with different spins on them. And so the brief filed on behalf of Kirby, which is really worth reading, it's surprisingly short. I mean, you know, Google it you know, when we're done here. But um, the brief file in Kirby does, in my mind, based on, I've, I've read every time there's a history of any kind of thing with Johnny Conference, I try and read it. Um, it, it spins the facts um, in, in an interesting way, including, I mean, they're making the argument that Jack was a traditional freelancer. And, and one of the things they say is he bought his own supplies. But I've seen, I own original art, I've seen original art, and some of that original art that Jack Kirby drew is on paper that has the Marvel logo on it. And I said to myself, well, if he bought his own supplies, then he managed to buy, did Marvel charge him for the paper that he bought? You know, was that, what were the rules? And, and so all that's, in, all that's in history. That's all, you know, that's all lost. Because even the people who would be witnesses to where Jack bought his art and how he got entertained, you know, most of them are, are gone. And that makes that whole historical perspective really interesting. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Well, the time is late, so we're going to end. But if you have other questions, and I'm sorry I didn't get to a couple of you, uh, feel free to come up. Uh, but thank you to the camera.